Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Sprout Social Fourth Quarter Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you will need to press star one in your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Mr. Jason Reckel, Head of Investor Relations. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and welcome to Sprout Social's fourth quarter and full year 2020 earnings call. We will be discussing the results announced in our press release issued after the market closed today and have also released an updated investor presentation, which can be found on our website. With me are Sprout Social's CEO, Justin Howard, CFO, Joe Del Preto, and President Ryan Barreto. Today's call will contain forward-looking statements which are made pursuant to the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Forward-looking statements include statements concerning financial and business trends, our expected future business and financial performance and financial condition, our guidance for the first quarter of 2021 and the full year 2021, and can be identified by words such as expect, anticipate, intend, plan, believe, seek, or will. These statements reflect our views as of today only, should not be relied upon as representing our views at any subsequent date, and we do not undertake any duty to update these statements. Forward-looking statements address matters that are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. For a discussion of the risks and important factors that could affect our actual results, please refer to our annual report on Form 10-K for the fiscal year ended December 31st, 2019, filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, our quarterly reports on Form 10-Q, and our annual report on Form 10-K for the fiscal year ended December 31st, 2020, to be filed with the SEC, as well as our other filings with the SEC. During the call, we'll discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures, which are not prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Definitions of these non-GAAP financial measures, along with reconciliation to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures, are included in our earnings press release, which has been furnished to the SEC and is also available on our website at investors.sproutsocial.com. And with that, let me turn the call over to Justin. Thank you, Jason, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. As we roll into a new year and our second as a public company, I want to express my gratitude to our employees, our partners, and our customers. We're in a fortunate position to share amazing results today because of the many people that have contributed to our success. Our teams delivered an emphatic close to 2020, and we expect to deliver a fantastic 2021 as social takes center stage in the digital strategy for millions of businesses around the globe. I want to first briefly touch on our fourth quarter results, then discuss high-level trends in our business and market that have occurred over the past year, which will build into our priorities for 2021. Our accelerating growth and strong results across the board give us confidence in our strategy and the investments we're making in our future. Social has never been more mission critical, and our momentum and competitive position have never been stronger. During Q4, we delivered record net new ARR added a record number of greater than 10K customers, drove meaningful improvements in customer retention and growth, and saw an acceleration in ACV growth as our product and upmarket strategies take hold. We also delivered on our commitment to growth with leverage, expanding our operating margins by more than 1,200 basis points year over year, while nearly doubling the ARR added to our business in Q4 versus a year ago. Looking back over the full year, 2020 made it clear that social media will be a cornerstone in the next evolution of business. Social has dramatically changed the way businesses reach, engage, serve, and build relationships with their customers and potential customers. It's not simply a way to market a brand, it's increasingly becoming the brand. And beyond marketing, it's helping companies evolve what they make, who they make it for, how they sell it, how they compete, and how they deliver world-class experiences. Sprout has emerged as the platform that makes this possible for thousands of brands across the globe as a social system of record, action, and intelligence. We're being pulled into new use cases across our customers' organizations as social is taking on bigger and more diverse roles across business strategy. 
This is also driving a second order of adoption as brands graduate to more sophisticated social strategies with a bigger footprint and larger levels of investment. Meanwhile, our platform is getting better every day. It's getting structurally stickier and the barriers to entry are rapidly rising. Our emphasis on world-class user experience uniquely positions us for both greenfield adoption as well as expansion as more stakeholders become involved in social across more of the companies we serve. Further, the way businesses evaluate, buy, implement, and integrate software has evolved slowly over the past several years and then much more rapidly in 2020. We are perfectly positioned for this evolution with the right technology, culture, and distribution model to match this new approach to buying software. Buyers expect tools to be easy to use, easy to buy, and immediately familiar. We believe the traditional playbook of buying and selling software based on sales pitches, cam demos, or slide decks is fading. Prospects should and will demand to prove value for themselves. For 10 years, we've been leading with the product, and the shift in buyer expectations has expanded our advantage. The growing role and importance of social, the strength of our product, and our buyer-aligned go-to-market strategy have combined to create an outsized advantage to win an already compelling and growing market. Looking into 2021, we're driving investments and innovation to help our customers fully lean into the power of social media to transform the entirety of their organizations. We continue to invest in our core capabilities that power the top customer-rated platform in our industry and build new capabilities to shape what's next. We're investing in the next generation of messaging experiences, social care, social commerce, engagement, publishing, listening, advocacy, reputation, and analytics. We made material improvements to nearly every aspect of our platform in 2020, delivered eight new partner integrations, and once again earned recognition from G2 with top software awards in eight different categories, including highest satisfaction product, best product for marketers, best product for enterprise, and best product for customer service. Sprout also continues to be recognized for our standout culture, team, and our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We were recently recognized by Glassdoor as one of the best places to work in 2021, which is our fourth year of such an honor. Battery Ventures ranked Sprout number two on a list of 25 highest rated public cloud companies to work for during the period where COVID had transformed the way we all work. We were also recognized by Great Place to Work as a top workplace for parents and by Fortune as a top workplace for women. Our commitments to our team and our customers aren't just part of our values. They're also critical to our strategy and are proving to be a key advantage as our team is able to adapt quickly to a rapidly changing market and deliver world-class experiences to our customers. We're especially proud of both our customer and workplace recognition with the backdrop of everything that was happening in 2020. As Ryan and Joe will discuss shortly in 2021, we'll continue to invest aggressively in driving new business, expanding our existing customer relationships, expanding the opportunity and contribution of our add-on products, investing in international growth, and improving yield across our sales and marketing processes. The foundations we've built in product, culture, customer experience, and distribution position us well for an expanding market opportunity. We've told you previously that we have a $25 billion current market opportunity and a greater than $50 billion expanded TAM. A year after publishing these numbers, our ACVs are up nearly 20%, new use cases have emerged, and according to Facebook, the number of businesses on Facebook properties alone is more than doubled from 90 million to greater than 200 million. Our opportunity is rapidly expanding. The need to address social is rising and our value proposition is growing disproportionately. We plan to update you with more specific granularity on our TAM and our formal analyst event later this year. Before I turn the call over, I also want to acknowledge Ryan's recent promotion to president. As you've all seen for yourselves, Ryan is a remarkable leader in person. For the past four plus years, Ryan has made an outsized impact to our people, our customers, our culture, and our business. In Ryan's new role, we formally aligned the sales, success, and marketing organizations to expand on the success we've seen in the fluid relationship across these functions throughout the customer life cycle. I'm looking forward to Ryan's continued contributions and working even more closely with him as we tackle the opportunities in front of us. Congratulations, Ryan, now over to you. Thank you, Justin, and thanks for the ongoing trust, guidance, and support. I'm incredibly proud of our team's fourth quarter performance, which shines a light on the sheer size of our opportunity. Justin's right. Social is more important 
to more businesses than ever before, and we feel like we're just warming up. Our business and competitive differentiators are becoming more pronounced, which is why this is the perfect time to more closely align our sales, success, and marketing efforts in a tightly integrated go-to-market motion. I'm excited to partner even more closely with our talented CMO, Jamie Gilpin, and our entire marketing team, who's been building one of the best inbound engines in SaaS. My goal for today is to provide insight into what we're seeing from customers and what it looks like when organizations begin to fully operationalize social. I'll start by sharing some interesting data points about the way buyer behavior is evolving. According to a recent report from Trust Radius, 87% of B2B technology buyers now want a self-service option. Trust Radius found that the top three things that buyers trust and are influenced by are free trials, product demos, and user reviews. As you know well, we lead with the trial, and according to G2, which compiled feedback from more than 3,000 customers, Sprout's user reviews lead the industry in every category. We've built a product and a sales motion that matches the modern software buyer with a the product they want to buy. It's our mission to get the users' hands on the keyboard, empowering them to engage with our technology and our team well before they need to make a commitment to us. And this is how we live. These preferences are likely to have permanently shifted over the past 12 months. According to a study by McKinsey, more than three quarters of buyers and sellers say they now prefer digital self-serve and remote human engagement over face-to-face -face interactions. And that's likely to sustain moving forward because we've not only adapted to this new reality, but we've seen the efficacy of remote engagement improve a thousand basis points in 2020. Coming out of a year in which social media was a center of gravity for conversations around COVID, racial injustice, and a presidential election, we were recently alerted to how conversations on Reddit and other social networks can literally move markets as well. Brands of all sizes and across all departments, including PR, comms, investor relations, and the C-suite, are well aware that social is fundamental and mission critical to their business. To quote McKinsey, the best companies intimately understand their customer's experience. They use data and analytics to synchronize the e-commerce experience with physical stores, social media, and other channels, making it seamless for the customer to shift among them. And this is exactly where we fit in. Sprout is a social system of record, giving brands a central management platform to harness the power of social. Shifting to our quarterly performance, net new listening ARR grew sequentially at the fastest pace in 2020. Premium analytics had a record quarter on all metrics, and our premium products in aggregate continued to deliver greater than 100% year-over-year growth. Leveraging Sprout, these customers can now unlock significant business insights with the trillions of data points that exist on social today. It was very impressive to see another quarter where all of our segments were strong, especially at market. Our customer retention is structurally improving, and customers continue to come to Sprout with acute and urgent needs to address social. A sample of the brands that we grew with this quarter includes Radisson Hotel Group, Ole Miss University, Eddie Bauer, Wipro, Pure Gyms, PagerDuty, and Udemy. A great example of a new customer brand that selected Sprout is RingCentral, a leading provider of global enterprise cloud communications, collaboration, and contact center solutions. Through Sprout, Ring Central is now able to more effectively service their customers across all social channels and gather insights to provide better customer support. By utilizing our social listening solutions, they can monitor the health of their brand and actively measure overall brand performance in the market. We also began working with Panera Bread. Claire Tishner, the social media care and brand protection manager, said, we made the decision to go with Sprout this year in an effort to find an intuitive tool for our marketing and customer service teams. In less than two months, we've gotten response times on social from 28 minutes to 10 minutes on average, even despite higher volumes. We gained so much efficiency with the smart inbox and asset library that we've changed our 2021 target from 30 minutes to 15 minutes for customer response times. We're thrilled with the fast, tangible return on investment that we've realized and value our partnership with Sprout. We also began a new relationship with WWUSA, formerly known as Weight Watchers. Robin Macy, Senior Social Media Manager, shared, self-service and ease of use were two of our most important qualities when choosing a partner, and Sprout has been a dream. 
Sprout has a robust feature set to enable us to effectively manage our social media marketing efforts, but has not compromised a seriously user-friendly experience. Whether it's seamless collaboration on our social campaigns or the use of social listening to consistently monitor our brand pulse, Sprout's platform allows us to do everything we need in one unified environment. Wrapping up, I continue to be inspired by the performance of our people at Sprout. Our success has raised the bar for an even better 2021. Our strong employer brand, culture, innovative business model, and disruptive technology are a unique combination. It has enabled us to build an elite team and to take great care of our customers. We are excited by what lies ahead, and as always, we appreciate your support. With that, I'll turn it over to Joe to run through the financials. Joe? Thanks, President Barreto. I'll now walk you through our fourth quarter and full year 2020 results in detail before moving on to guidance for the first quarter and full year 2021. Total revenue for the fourth quarter was $37.3 million, representing 33% year-over-year growth. Excluding the impact from legacy simply measured, organic revenue was up 36% year-over-year. For the full year 2020, total revenue was $132.9 million, up 29% year-over-year. Organic revenue was up 36%. Total ARR exiting Q4 was $158.3 million, up 34% year-over-year. Organic ARR was $157.2 million, up 36% year-over-year. We again achieved record net new ARR with health across the entirety of our business and acceleration in ACV. We added 1,162 net new customers in Q4 to finish the year with 26,718 customers up 13% year over year. This fantastic net ads result is a reflection of very strong performance across all of our segments. As your quarterly reminder, we remain focused on long-term double-digit customer growth with a focus on high-quality unit economics. The number of customers contributing more than $10,000 in ARR reached 3,149, up 44% from a year ago, and up from 2,790 in Q3 2020. The attach rates of both listening and premium analytics are rising across the customer base as businesses harness the power of social data. We are leaning into a full platform because our customers are operationalizing social across the entirety of their business. We expect that this will drive durable ACV expansion with even stronger unit economics for many years to come. Our mix of enterprise and mid-market customers is also growing. Within this, our large customers are getting bigger. This resulted in acceleration in our ACV to 19% growth, even after two quarters in a row, of accelerating overall customer growth. In discussing the remainder of the income statement, please note that unless otherwise stated, all references to our expenses, operating results, and share account are on a non-GAAP basis. Now reconcile to our GAAP results in the earnings press release that was just issued before this call. In Q4, gross profit was $27.9 million, representing a gross margin of 74.6%. This is up 210 basis points compared to gross margin of 72.5% a year ago and compared with 74.4% last quarter. Sales and marketing expenses for Q4 were $15.7 million, or 42% of revenue, down from 46% a year ago. We are continuing to accelerate our pace of hiring across both our sales and marketing teams so we have the right capacity to meet very strong inbound demand. Research and development expenses for Q4 were $7.3 million, or 20% of revenue, down from 24% a year ago. We have aggressive R&D growth goals in 2021 as we pull forward our multi-year product engineering investment plan to be an expanding set of use cases. General administrative expenses for Q4 were 8.2 million or 22% of revenue, down from 25% a year ago. We expect general administrative expenses to decrease as a percent of revenue as we continue to scale our operations. Non-GAAP operating loss for Q4 was 3.3 million for a negative 9% operating margin. This compares with a negative 21% operating margin a year ago. We meaningfully outperformed our expectations due to higher revenue in the time of many key hires that had start dates in January of 2021. For the full year 2020, a non-GAAP operating loss was 20.9 million or negative 16% operating margin compared to an operating margin of negative 21% in 2019. We are pleased with a 570 basis point annual improvement in our operating margin. Non-GAAP net loss for Q4 was 3.4 million for a net loss of six cents per share based on 53.1 million weighted average shares of common stock outstanding. 
compared to a net loss of $5.9 million a year ago. Turning to the balance sheet and cash flow statement, we had a coupon with $163.9 million in cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities, down from $167.3 million at the end of Q3 2020. Deferred revenue at the end of the quarter was $43.8 million. Looking both our billed and unbilled contracts, our remaining performance obligations, or RPO, totaled approximately $64.4 million, up from $53.9 million as in Q3 2020, and up approximately 53% year over year. We expect to recognize approximately 85% or $54.7 million of total RPO as revenue over the next 12 months. Operating cash flow in Q4 was negative 0.2 million compared to negative 4.7 million a year ago. Free cash flow was negative 1.97 million in Q4 for negative 5% free cash flow margin, compared to a negative 4.9 million and negative 17% free cash flow margin a year ago. As a reminder, our Q4 2020 free cash flow included approximately 1.8 million of one-time expenses to build out our Seattle office. For the full year of 2020, free cash flow was negative 15 million or negative 12% free cash flow margin, compared to negative 15% free cash flow margin in 2019. In addition to leverage in our financial model, the ongoing shift to annual and multi-year contracts has a positive impact on our free cash flow. In 2020, our overall dollar-based net retention rate was 110%, consistent with 110% in 2019. Our dollar-based net retention rate, excluding SMB customers, was 117% in 2020, compared with 120% in 2019. As we have talked about previously, we initially saw headwinds in our business from COVID-19 that were relatively isolated within Q2. This impact was primarily elevated at the beach nerd and slower expansion activity in our agency and mid-market segments. However, these factors each reversed in the second half of 2020 we are very pleased with the current trajectory of net retention. In Q4 of 2020, our overall dollar-based net retention exceeded 110% and our ex-SMB dollar-based net retention exceeded 120%. We believe that increasing platform stickiness, accelerating seed expansion, changing segment mix and rising attach rates of our premium modules will each positively impact our expansion rates and drive multi-year acceleration in NDR from current levels. Moving on to guidance. For the first quarter of fiscal 2021, we expect total revenue in the range of 39.6 to 39.7 million, or growth rate of 30%. We expect our organic growth rate to be low single digit percentage points faster than our reported growth rate as we lap inorganic revenue from a year ago. This will be the last quarter in which we experience a material difference in our organic and reported growth rates. We do not expect to discuss the difference beyond the first quarter. We expect non-GAAP operating loss in a range of 5.4 million to 5.0 million. This represents an anticipated operating margin of negative 13.1%, an improvement of more than 1,100 basis points year over year. We're making aggressive R&D investments to address an expanding set of opportunities. We are continuing to accelerate the pace of hiring across most of our go-to-market functions and are continuing to build depth across the rest of the company. We're doing this while delivering improvement in our operating margins highlighting the efficiencies across our company as we scale. We expect a non-GAAP net loss per share of between 11 cents and 10 cents, assuming approximately 53.4 million weighted average basic shares of common stock outstanding. For the full fiscal 2021, we expect total revenue in a range of 172 million to 173 million. This is an expected overall reported growth rate of 30%. For 2021, we expect non-GAAP operating loss in a range of 22 million to 19 million. This implies a non-GAAP operating margin of negative 11.9% and operating margin improvement of roughly 400 basis points year over year. We remain focused on delivering durable, multi-year growth with compelling profitability leverage. We expect a non-GAAP net loss per share of between 40 cents and 37 cents, assuming approximately 53.6 million weighted basic shares of common stock outstanding. Of note, for 2021 planning purposes, we have assumed many employees may return to our offices sometime mid-year, and that our annual corporate events and travel expenses will occur throughout the summer compared with Q1 during 2020. In summary, we believe we are uniquely positioned to capitalize on the opportunity for durable multi-year growth as social moves to the center of digital strategy. Our compelling financial leverage and strengthening free cash flow trajectory give us confidence to make optimized investments that we believe 
will enable us to achieve our full potential. With that, Justin, Ryan, and I are happy to take any of your questions. Operator? As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star one in your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. And your first question comes from the line of Ray Molenchow from Barclays. Your line is open. Hey, thanks for taking my question and congrats on a great finish to the year. Um, um, I wanted to go back to the dollar net retention numbers you gave out and the about 120% over uh, in Q, that we saw in Q4 if you X out the S&B part. Like, can you talk a little bit about the drivers of that and, and, and what are the, what, how do you see this changing going forward or evolving going forward? Then I have a follow-up, please. Yeah, hey, Rima, how are you? Uh, this is Justin. I'll, I'll start with that, and Joe may have something to add here. Um, so generally speaking, the, um, the XSMB uh, bucket uh, does contain our agency segments as well. Um, the SMB and agency were probably disproportionately impacted during uh, the Q2 timeframe, which we talked about. Um, and we did see some during that primarily Q2 and maybe part of Q3 timeframe um, some slower expansion in some of the existing customer base that may be looking to uh, grow with us and maybe have put a pause on things temporarily. So that generally just uh, came back to, to what we would normally expect of those levels for the remainder of the year, uh, which is where we saw that, that upward trend and uh, improved performance, frankly, over the last half of the year, um, but primarily just spilled through from the Q2 impact that we saw. Okay, perfect. And then uh, just one follow-up. Like as we all think about like the the world evolving this year with more vaccinations, etc. Like, what do you see in terms of early signals in terms of engagement levels with prospects, prospecting, etc. Um, like, how do you see this year playing out in terms of like is it like you know a decent first half, stronger second half, or like 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 how do you think about it uh, as you kind of look out? Thank you. Yeah, hey, Remo, this is Ryan. Uh, thanks for the question. You, you know, we feel really good about the trajectory of the business right now. We've proven through 2020 that our business uh, can quickly evolve and we're set up for this remote engagement. And all the data that we're seeing, um, even with vaccines, is, is really highlighting that this remote engagement digital interaction is going to be here to stay. And so when we think about the, the go-to-market motion that our team has, our success in being able to get customers up and running in a remote fashion, having them not only implement but drive adoption in a remote fashion has us really well set up on, on a go-forward. Um, so we, we feel like when we look at the rest of the year, we're well positioned to keep, uh, keep executing the way that we've been executing through 2020. Good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thank you. Your next question comes from a line of Rob Oliver from Baird. Your line is open. Great. Good evening, guys. Thank you very much for taking my questions. Um, J Justin, one for you. You made a comment in your prepared remarks about uh, being pulled into new use cases within the enterprise. Um, and I know just you know, just for following you guys for a while, definitely it's always interesting to encounter different departments that are using um, your software, but that sounded like it might be a little bit more to that. So just was wondering if you could maybe flush out that comment, and then I had a quick follow-up. Yeah, sure. Happy to do it here, Rob. Um, so, you know, I think what we're seeing really is uh, more volume of adoption across customers um, where our – most progressive customers previously had been looking at new use cases and had been starting to operationalize social um, into things like uh, their customer service, their product feedback loops, um, customer retention strategies, et cetera. I, I, what we're seeing right now is more than anything, there's just more businesses that have reached that level of maturity. Um, we're certainly seeing some new use cases as well. I think. Um, you know, the comms and investor relations is something that has come up uh, more specifically and, and acutely over the last couple quarters. Um, we're starting to see more of that. So the, uh, the one that I would flag that I think is going to be more material throughout 2021 is likely on the commerce side. Um, the others are use cases that we've seen just in small batches in the past, um, but it's starting to uh, – 
be something that we hear a lot more often and a lot more of the deals that we're in are, are thinking more holistically across the organization about social uh, than they were, you know, in prior quarters or, or a year ago. Great. Okay. That's, that's really helpful. Thanks uh, for that. And, and I don't know if this one's for, uh, for you or for, or for Ryan or for Joe, but I mean, Joe, I know you mentioned in your prepared remarks that the, uh, the operating budget includes, you know, all of the investments for this year. And, and, and Justice, you, Justin, you gave us some color um, on, um, you know, on what those were, you know, in a general sense. Uh, but so, so maybe I'll, I'll take that as a backdrop to Ryan and say, you know, as you're, uh, you know, seeing customers pull right now, clearly really good demand for, you know, premium products with 100% year-over-year growth, uh, listening. I, mean, I, I can't remember your exact words, but it sounds like, you know, customers are really scurrying to get this stuff. Um, can you talk a, maybe a little bit about, you know, uh, what, what, what some of those um, uh, investments might be or, or what you guys thinking to the extent that you can add color there. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks for the question, Rob. Um, in terms of, of investments, one, we feel really great going into this year with the momentum from last year. A few different areas that we see a lot of opportunity. We've, we've continued to see the upmarket potential, uh, continuing to invest there. Our marketing team has been doing a fantastic job. The top of the funnel has been incredibly healthy for us across all segments. Um, we'll continue to invest in some areas there, both on the SEO and SEM side, as that's proven to be a really fruitful, uh, fruitful thing for us. And then from a, from a team perspective, um, we see a lot of opportunity across all of our segments. Uh, and, you know, the ones where you could probably see outsized investment will continue to be the mid-market and enterprise space. Um, the, in, in terms of products, the, the product team has been, has been delivering some really great stuff for our customers. You're seeing it in the net dollar retention, uh, but also in the expansion of our, our new lands. And so you'll continue to see us uh, putting our, our foot down on the attach rates and those premium products. Thanks again. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Alex Kurtz from KeyBank. Your line is open. Hi, this is Michael. I'm for Alex, and congrats on the quarter. So as you head into 2021, are you making any changes to the Salesforce compensation around expanding customer spend versus acquiring new customers, and then also on the selling more add-on products? Hey, Mike, this, is, this is Ryan. Uh, we are not making any changes uh, to the, the way that we compensate. Um, we, we've always had the same model. So one thing that's probably important to note here is we have dedicated sales teams on both the new business side and then on the customer side. And so it's the same teams that are specialized in working with those customers. So, you know, our approach to 2021 will look very similar to, to what it did in 2020 from a, just from an expense standpoint. Okay, great. And then, is there anything you can have? Sorry. No, so, sorry about that. I was just going to add, I, I think part of the spirit of the question was just around the mix shift that we're seeing and, and some of the attach rates. Um, to Ryan's point, uh, we've baked a lot of that into the compensation model to date. Um, so we're carrying that through, and, and we think part of the, the attraction that we're seeing is certainly that alignment, um, but we see much the same opportunity in 2021. Okay, thanks a lot. And your next question comes from a line of Matt Van Vliet from BTIG. Your line is open. Yeah, hi guys. Um, great job on the quarter and uh, maybe just expanding on, on those last couple of questions, thinking about it a little differently. Um, you know, you talked about the, the fourth quarter really recovered on, and we'll go up market and say the rev, uh, dollar based revenue retention was, you know, 120 plus. Um, as you think about kind of proliferating through your existing customers with modules they're already using uh, versus, you know, selling some of the more premium uh, modules as, as an upsell, cross sell, can you help us break it down a little bit in terms of that, you know, additional sell? Um, what's what's contributing more there, and, and maybe how you think about that heading into 21? Yeah, th th this is just an all um, uh, add some color there. So we we see the um, both the expansion of ACVs on the core platform 
um, as well as the expansion when we've got attachment of the premium plot products. Um, both of those are growing at a very healthy clip. Um, we definitely are seeing more uh, uh, customer engagements where there are um, not just needs for those additional products, but needs for additional seats across the organization. Some of those additional use cases that we talked about, other departments that are being, uh, becoming involved in social. Um, we also have, um, there are some mechanics in the, the premium add-ons um, that do have a bit of leverage spend to them where um, as even those add-ons are adopted further across the uh, organization, um, there is greater investment involved with that in, in terms of uh, additional data, additional queries and things like that. Um, so we've got a couple of different um, uh, sort of pricing principles at play there, but we love that we're seeing the core platform just in its, in its uh, intended use without the, the, the add-ons. That is growing very nicely as well. Um, so both of those in combination um, has really been a great uh, tailwind for us. Uh, very helpful. And then as you look at uh, your international markets, it's really been a good good driver of growth uh, so far this year. Where where are you at or where do you feel like you you know you are in terms of your, your longer term plan in um, you know getting into specific markets, making you know kind of step function investments of, of opening local um, local offices and hiring local people. Um, I guess how long should we think about that? That is kind of a, a bigger uh, chunk of the the investment pie versus um, getting to a level where you can really start seeing some some tremendous efficiency there. Thanks, Matt. This is Ryan. Yeah, I, I would say that we're we're still very early innings here. We opened up our first international office back in 2019 in EMEA in Dublin and have seen really good progress with that group from a productivity standpoint. Um, getting people in the market has, has been uh, very helpful for us locally, being in the right time zone, in the right accent, uh, in the right language. We are continuing to invest there. I think that it's gonna be a big opportunity for us over the next number of years, expanding beyond just EMEA into APAC and LATAM, um, we are going to be increasing our headcount there uh, this year and the next few years. We also see just more localization opportunities, um, getting more marketing efforts within within those uh, within those international locations, and then also exploring channel opportunities internationally. So I'd say we're, we're early right now, but we do see it as a big lever in the future state for the company. All right, great. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Tom Roderick from Stiefel. Your line is open. Great. Hey, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, Justin, let me throw a product question at you here first, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about how the reputation product is being embraced by customers. But I guess the product question on reputation would be just sort of how, how ready is the product from a data ingestion machine learning analytics framework uh, to, uh, you know, to, to be able to take advantage of all of that unstructured data and then how integrated is it with the rest of the portfolio? So a bit of an open-ended question on that front, but we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, happy to speak to it. We're, we're, um, you had mentioned in the context of reputation, is that correct? Correct. Okay, cool. Yeah. So. Um, to the first part of that question, so the platform is built in a way, you know, while the data is unstructured and it's uh, a li little different than uh, some of the, the, the data structures of the other uh, social uh, platforms that we integrate with, um, it, there's not a ton of variation, right? There's some commonalities there and we've built against kind of those common frameworks. So for us to add new data sources on the ingest side um, is actually a pretty quick effort at this point. Like we've done the late work to get there. Um, now it's just about um, getting those uh, uh, relationships where we may not have those, uh, the ones that we do, um, deciding which capabilities we want to turn on. Um, so it's a pretty quick process. Um, and I do think that the, the tools that are built uh, are ready for the additional um, platforms that we'll add on that side. Um, the the big investments that you'll see from us on uh, uh, in the the reputation segment 
have primarily to do with adding those additional data sources like you mentioned, but also looking into uh, deeper analytics, um, better ability to identify uh, opportunities for improvement and things like that, uh, particularly across the, the larger organizations. Um, so you're going to see that team uh, within our product or make a ton of advances. We, we still consider the reputation product to be very much kind of a V1 um, with tons of room to grow. Yeah, that, that's great feedback. Thanks for that. And I guess my follow-up question here, I'll, I'll, I'll direct this one at uh, President Barreto. Uh, Ryan, congratulations on the promotion, greatly deserved. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about sort of your view on the upgrade path. Um, I mean, look, you had 1,200 new customer ads last quarter, almost 1,200 again this quarter. That's just a tremendous number relative to what you've been historically doing. Um, and so, you know, that flywheel seems like it can spin a little bit faster with respect to the upgrade path, but perhaps you could talk about that a little bit in the context of go to market, how you're arming your, your reps with, uh, with the tools they need to successfully upgrade at a faster clip. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, we, we are really excited. As you said, the customer ads have been awesome. It's a combination of just great execution from the marketing team and driving awesome top of funnel, as well as the sales team really getting after it. Um, you add in there that for us, obviously we want to land as big as we can with our, our premium products, uh, but the team also realizes that part of, uh, part of what's made us so successful here is just the velocity of the sales motion. And so when we get these customers in the product, we, we get their hands on not just publishing and engagement, but analytics and listening. And if we can't secure the full deal right away, that's okay. We've got a sales team and a great customer success team on, on the other side that's able to, as you said, kind of go in and, and increase the velocity of the flywheel. So we're trying to land bigger, but even when we don't, we're setting up the team from a customer success and growth perspective to know what opportunities exist there that we're going to be able to grow. And because we have those dedicated sales team on both the new business side and the growth side, we feel like we're well covered as we continue to, to have these, these opportunities to grow. And the last thing I'll just say here, and Justin touched on it earlier, is for us, it's not just these premium add-on products, which add a tremendous amount of value. We're just seeing the proliferation of use cases and users across the organization. So even if we land in marketing today, our growth teams, our customer success teams know there's a customer care use case on the other side and many others. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how we're thinking about it right now, making sure that the team knows the, the full gambit of opportunity that exists when, when they're looking at the potential of an account. Great detail. That's wonderful. Nice job on, the, on finishing a great year. I'll jump back in the queue. Thanks, Tom. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Merlin from Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Okay, thanks so much for taking the question. Um, I think one of the things you, you all mentioned in the prepared remarks was improving the yield on, on sales and marketing spend. And I know there's you know, an effort to, to grow internationally. Of course, you're showing great traction on market as well. So can you talk a bit about how you're balancing the increased you know, investment in sales and marketing with improving that that yield as well. Like what specifically will we be, be driving that up as, as we move through 2021? Thank you. Yeah, so one of the, uh, thanks for the question. One of the things that is kind of a driving force in the, in the new business acquisition in the top of the funnel um, really revolves around conversion rates from the, the demo process, from the free trials, et cetera, um, where we're able to con continually make uh, improvements across all of that uh, upper funnel um, part of the business. So while we're investing heavily and uh, making uh, tremendous progress uh, building out the teams on the acquisition side, there's still an opportunity for improved yield um, when we think about just what does the funnel look like from our content strategy into the trial or demo flow uh, or from folks that are visiting our website, um, et cetera, and getting them fully engaged in the, in the sales cycle. Okay, great, thank you. And maybe just a quick follow-up for Joe. On the billing number, that was really strong, you know, accelerated strongly in the, in the quarter. Um, as you sign larger customers, who I assume are on annual billing, can, can you talk a bit about to what degree you saw any sort of duration tailwinds in the quarter? Um, and are you able to sort of say what it was like organically or, or maybe, maybe it, um, there, there wasn't much of a tailwind, but just curious about any impact you could call out there, thanks. Yeah, on the billing front there, Chris, I think one thing we're seeing now um, 
as we've moved more to the mid-market enterprise, we're definitely seeing, you know, a, a much stronger, let's say, Q4 than we had historically, right? We're getting more of those enterprise deals that are closing towards the end of the year. And so you saw a little bit of that with the acceleration in billings in the quarter. We're also, you know, the sales team is, is, is incented now to close annual deals. So there's definitely an incentive on that side um, when it comes to annual versus monthly. And so I, it's, I, you're also going to see a little bit more momentum on that front, even down market in the SMB to agency space, because there's more incentive now to, to kind of to sign those annual deals. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Congrats on, congrats on a great year. Your next question comes from a line of Arjun Bhatia from William Blair. Your line is open. Hey guys, thank you for taking my question, and uh, I'll add my congrats on the results. Really great, uh, really great quarter. Um, Justin, maybe I'll start off with uh, with you on the first uh, on a product related question. You, you touched in your prepared remarks on, you know, add investing more in, in core capabilities around care and, and commerce, um, and I think you emphasized commerce maybe a little bit uh, to an earlier question, but. As you're thinking of enhancing these capabilities, I'm just curious how you're thinking of maybe um, spinning these capabilities out as separate solutions versus incorporating them uh, into the core platform and, and, and giving customers access to it that are already subscribed to, um, uh, to the engagement side of the, uh, side of the platform. Yeah, good, good, great question. So, um, you know, from the product side, I think that we, there, there are a couple flavors um, when we're thinking about the roadmap and the things that we're going to be building, um, a, a couple categories that they fall into. I, I think one is, um, you know, what we would consider to be part of the core capabilities, but certainly our enhancements uh, and improvements for our customers, where there's an opportunity to drive um, uh, not only retention and expansion, um, but just deal size, uh, seat count, et cetera, um, and, and monetize those improvements while not on new SKUs. Um, very much in a way that flows through to the to, to the unit economics, to the to the ACBs, and, and to the, the growth opportunities. Um, so that's one flavor. And then the other typically comes when we've seen enough gravity around a certain set of features. So similar to what you saw from us with reputation or analytics or listening, um, once we've built out the capabilities to a point where they are um, fitting a, a, a specific use case, where they are above and beyond. Um, what the um, core platform, uh, what the customers need of the core platform, there's an opportunity for us to repackage that as an additional SKU, and I think you're going to see some of that from us as well. You'll also, um, you know, reputation is an example of where we brought an entirely new capability into the fold um, and monetize that through the, the, the addition of, of profiles and locations that our customers are managing. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways that that product development um, starts to contribute to revenue, um, whether through a new SKU or the, the things I mentioned, where it's, it's retention, it's expansion, uh, additional seats, et cetera. Great, that's very helpful color. Um, and then I wanted to touch on um, your customer additions. You, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but um, you know, it looks like over the last two quarters, I think you've added just as many new customers as you did in, in 2019. So great to see the momentum there. Um, but as you're looking at this new cohort, I'd be curious to see if you're, um, if, if you're noticing any differences in how these customers are coming into your funnel, how they're landing, the expansion cadence, anything else that you can point out with this cohort relative to um, what you've seen historically in new customers that come into the platform. Yeah, thanks for the question, Arthur. This is Ryan. Um, you know, most of it actually feels very similar. So we're running a lot of the same plays. If I think about the marketing approach and are focusing on content marketing and, dr and driving people to, to our site and to our trial, a, a lot of those plays look the same. We've certainly increased the throughput on content um, and we're having great conversations with those customers, but the approach has been very similar. You know, that what I will say is, you know, and you can see it in the ACV increase in 19%, we're landing these customers much bigger and we're having more growth opportunities for the current customer base. So I think it, the major takeaways are we've seen an evolution of, of the customers coming in. Justin mentioned it a little bit before. There's a different sophistication for these customers. There's more use cases, which means typically more users and, and, and oftentimes more of the add-ons. 
Um, and, and I think that's, that's one of the big things. The other thing, and Joe mentioned a, a few minutes ago, is just the opportunity to grow these customers into longer term contracts as well. So generally just feel really great about the cohort that we've been seeing um, this whole year and, and especially in Q3 and Q4. A, a quick add there, I think uh, another important point that we've um, uh, talked about a bit in the past is um, somewhat out of the norm, our customers, the larger that they come in, the, the more likely and to greater magnitude they are to grow. Um, and so it's not a case where uh, they're, while our ACVs are growing, that actually represents a bigger growth opportunity for us, um, which is counter to what um, you may see in some other models. Perfect. Thank you. Congrats again, and Ryan, congrats on the promotion. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Stan Zlosky from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. Um, actually, I wanted to follow up on the on the on the previous question on um, on net ads, but specifically focus on the uh, on the, the the much bigger customers you guys are landing. I mean, essentially. The greater than 10K, the 359 that you put up net new in Q4, uh, it, it was actually as much as you put up in all of the first half of 2020. Um, so, how much of the of these larger, you know, the 10K plus uh, net new ads, how much of it was just existing customers kind of crossing over that threshold versus net new logo lands? And then just to follow up on that specifically for the net new logo lands, what's driving those larger lands? Um, for those, you know, 10 plus, 10K plus customers. And I have a quick follow-up. Cool. Thanks, Dan. This is Ryan. Uh, it, it's actually a pretty healthy balance when you, you think about the net ads at 10K. We've certainly seen our uh, new business acquisition continue to execute really well. Q4 is historically a really strong quarter for the upmarket customers, so we saw a lot of success there. Uh, but we've also seen a lot of growth happening from our current install base. Um, and then that tends to be both users and add-ons. So uh, I, I would say it's a pretty healthy balance right now. And again, this goes back to the, to the fact that we have dedicated teams on both the new business as well as the customer growth side. Um, so pretty, pretty healthy one-two punch there uh, from that perspective. And then I think your second question was, it was just about what, what's driving the larger Growth, the larger ads. Yeah, the the, the the initial lands above the 10K. What's driving that um, uh, the, the momentum there? Yeah, so it's uh, it's kind of a healthy combination again of both the the users and the premium add-ons. Um, from a user perspective, what I've seen change over the four and a half years that I've been here is just uh, the number of, of users that want access to the platform. Now, when I first started, what used to be uh, a marketing person that was responsible for social has, has expanded to social media teams that need access, people in the marketing department across PR, comms, brand content. And, and now more and more we're seeing it go into care, um, social care, so social support, as well as just business users who are trying to tap into the business intelligence from, from social. So it's this combination of more users landing but then we've added these premium products over the last couple of years, and they've, they've really started to take hold over the last year um, from a, a listening and analytics perspective. Uh, so it's, it's been a good combination of both, but I'd say that the users is, is um, slightly greater than the add-on products at this point. Got it. That's very helpful. Um, thank you, Ryan. And um, maybe just a follow-up for, uh, for Joe. Um, Joe, it, when, when, we, when we look at um, – commentary around you, you guys getting into uh, new use cases like investor relations, communications, as well as just a very strong traction with uh, add-ons like listening, premium analytics, uh, reputation. Um, and then we put that in the context of you, you, you saying that you know, net dollar retention rate can really um, start to accelerate from, uh, from here, from the current levels. How high can it go, right? You know, as we all sit down and kind of start to calibrate our models, um, where should you know, uh, how high can the net dollar retention rates go as we go into 21, 22, and beyond? Thank you. Yes, yeah, I think you know without giving out a a specific specific number, I think over the next you know you know multiple years we see this number continue to increase. We we don't see a um, 
really a ceiling right now as far as like pegging to a number. I, I will say that our larger customers grow at, you know, way more than the 120% we have. And so if we if we look back, for example, stand five to seven years ago and look at our top decile customers and what they were growing at, there's there's no reason to believe that, you know, you know, four or five, you know, six years from now that we can't have a large part of our customer base growing at what our NDR now is now and then our top decile customers are growing even faster than that. And so we feel pretty good about maintaining, you know, growth in those areas for, for at least the, the future we can see right now. Got it. Thank you so much, guys. Your next question comes from the line of David Hines from Canaccord Genuity. Your line is open. Hey, thanks, guys. Congrats on the results. Uh, gr great to see the acceleration. Justin, I, I want to ask a question about how you see this space uh, evolving. Um, so, so if we take a firm like Qualtrics, right, and a bunch of us initiated coverage on that stock this morning, so I, I think it's top of mind for investors. If we think about what they're doing in experience management, where, you know, for them, you know, survey is the primary mode of, of data collection. How, how do you think the problem they're solving kind of overlaps with, with your capabilities in, in listening or, or reputation? Like, do, do you see the functional Venn diagrams or use cases for the tech converging over time and, and and look obviously these are these are huge markets there's plenty of room for, for both of you guys but I'd, I'd love to get uh, you, your, your thoughts on that yeah um, yeah great question thank you so a, a couple things I'd say there I, I think you know when we think about the type of data that exists in the, um, the, the listening and the analytics tools that we're providing to our customers, um, that is data that is immensely valuable specifically because it's not targeted um, as a, a survey might be or a focus group might be. Um, these are the folks that uh, don't have a specific polar inclination uh, to provide feedback, but they're speaking their mind. They're talking about their preferences and their trends. Um, and I think that that's a really important aspect that businesses have been starting to um, really understand the value there and being able to understand not just the known universe, but what about all of the people that we're not yet working with that we don't yet know? What, what is it that they want? Um, how can we better serve them? So I think that's an important distinction. I think some of that um, uh, uh, organizations like Qualtrics can start to get to. So I, I, I certainly think that there's a bit of overlap there. But the other thing that I'll say, you know, a lot of the value that our platform provides is because it's horizontal in nature. And what I mean by that is the people that, that can then turn that information into action, um, whether it's planning campaigns or understanding how to better serve uh, 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 customers through engagement on the platforms, et cetera, it's all fluid, right? It's, it's all happening in the same place. The marketers, the customer service people, the product people, everyone can be working in the same place. Um, and that, creates a really interesting dynamic for our customers. So it's kind of like, where's the proximity to the action? Um, and where can we get real-time information um, that really kind of have a pulse on, on the, the world um, to drive quicker decisions? And so I, I think that'll be a distinction, um, but probably the bigger of the two is just the fact that all of those use cases are able to come together and sprout um, and able to drive um, kind of immediate action across the platforms that are really shaping brands today. So I, I think that's going to continue to be important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good color there. Um, and then I, I want to ask about social commerce. Uh, look, I, I'm not sure I've, I've heard you talk about it in the past, and it's come up now a, a handful of times on the call. Can, can you just elaborate maybe on like where specifically the EC opportunities there, and and, and how Sprout might participate. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, um, you know, I'll start by saying um, it's the commitment from the platforms around commerce has really picked up over the last couple of quarters. I think we've, we've heard that on some of their earnings and just seen that in some of the things that they're focused on. Um, for us, the, the opportunity is in two dimensions. The first is any time that there is more engagement happening in social channels, that's uh, an area where we uh, uh, can add value to our customers and stand to benefit, right? The more business that's happening through social channels, whether it's private, public, et cetera, 
um, the more need they have for tools like ours that are able to uh, capture that conversation, to be able to engage with it, to drive those things, et cetera. So it's kind of like a rising tide effect. Um, the more things that we do as consumers that are happening in social, the better. The second dimension is kind of directly around uh, commerce and the capabilities that the platforms will introduce. So where, where are the opportunities for us to, whether it be uh, uh, to be providing uh, analytics on um, the efficiency of those efforts, whether it's to actually provide publishing tools around um, getting those, those products and those, those digital storefronts in front of people, um, whether it's uh, using the listening data uh, to start to kind of tailor those offerings and, and adjust them in real time. There's a lot of different ways that that could play out. Um, we're working on a handful of things related to commerce. That will evolve a lot through 21, um, particularly as it becomes clear what the, uh, the kind of variety of, of uh, efforts from the various platforms is going to be. I think that's still kind of early days. Yeah. Yeah, very helpful. Okay, uh, thanks, guys. Congrats again. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Scott Berg from Needham & Company. Your line is open. Hi, everyone. Congrats on a great quarter. And I see we're up against the clock, so I'll make it one question. But uh, one I'm trying to, to figure out is um, your platforms obviously had a big – a uh, big benefit from some of the work at home trends and as people are just online more, whether it's from the supporters from the marketing kind of front office needs that we've spoken about historically. But how do you start thinking about the usage of the platform moving forward as things reopen a little bit here this year? At least I hope it's going to reopen this year. Yeah, great question. I, I mean, I, I think the way that we think about it is um, you know, the, the events over the last year really behaved as a catalyst for um, new ways of, of interaction and engagement. Um, it was the, the hurdle that allowed people to discover something better, um, that interacting with brands and, and, and buying products in this way, et cetera, um, is a great experience, right? Uh, similar to people who maybe haven't made a, a purchase through Amazon Prime before, and now they do, and, and they're discovering something that, 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 that can be very beneficial. So um, a lot of that is going to be, at least in our opinion, lasting effect, right? Um, that this was inevitable over a longer period of time. It's been accelerated. Um, but we think that a lot of the trends in terms of just consumer engagement with brands across social um, is going to stick around. The hours might change, you know, as more people go into the office, et cetera, but um, that hasn't shifted so dramatically uh, over the last year that there's any reason to believe that there's like some pent up um, shift happening. Um, we think it's probably just accelerating uh, on a faster timeline than it might have on its own. Great. That does it for me. Congrats on a great quarter again. All right. Thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Brett Knobloch from Berenberg Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so that's one quick one for me. Um, you mentioned the messaging experience a bit in the prepared remarks. I wonder if you could elaborate on that and, you know, maybe how your, your product is currently set up or what you have to do to get it set up to enable your customers to engage with their customers via messaging channels. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, the, the, the product is, uh, is set up to do that today. It does that today. Um, you know, when we think about our investments uh, around messaging, uh, some of it has to do with just expansion of channels, right? There are more options uh, for people who want to communicate that way with, with, with brands and the folks that they do business with. Um, so we want to make sure that we've got good, good coverage there. But we've also seen as those as those patterns have evolved and as that's become the preferred channel of communication with many brands, um, there's just additional capabilities that we can be adding there to, um, you know, it's this uh, dynamic environment where you can introduce um, new capabilities that just aren't possible over phone or email or others. And so us thinking about, you know, what is, what is the next couple of generations of, of those messaging interactions look like um, and then making sure we've got that coverage uh, and that we're everywhere our customers need to be from a messaging perspective. Um, those are really our, our priorities on, on that uh, aspect of the, of the platform this year. 
representing most of us. There are no further questions at this time. Mr. Justin Howard, I turn the call back over to you for some closing remarks. All right, fantastic. Well, um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, thanks for the great questions. Uh, I, I think we did go over a few minutes, so thank you for that. I know there's a busy day today. Um, uh, thanks always for the support uh, uh, to the team, and um, we look forward to catching up with you in uh, uh, our conversations throughout the quarter, some of the events we'll be attending. Um, have a wonderful evening. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You